Hi, before we get started on my lecture, I'm going to ask you to get a good fair copy of T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men, printed out and there in front of you so that you can easily follow the observations I'm going to make in my lecture. Now this lecture is going to attempt to shed light on the poem through a reading of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. And we know that T.S. Eliot wanted to make his poem an homage to the novella Heart of Darkness because of the epigraph at the very beginning uh, wherein a native comes up to Marlowe and says, Mr. Kurtz, he dead. And this epigraph comes before the first stanza of the poem. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and see how we can make connections not only to Conrad's novella, but also to some of the things we discovered in, in Heart of Darkness, which I talked about in parts one and two of my lecture series of this unit. Hope you enjoy it. So Marlowe listens at great length to this uh, brick maker who, who tells him a lot about who Kurtz is. He starts to hear a lot of details. Uh, he says um, uh, in the previous page that he was an quote, emissary of pity and science and progress and the devil knows what else. Um, we, uh, we want for the guidance of the cause entrusted to us by Europe, so to speak, higher intelligence, wide sympathies, a singleness of purpose. So he's saying all this stuff and it goes on for a long paragraph and at the end, this is in the bottom of your page, 95, uh, Marlowe says, I let him run on this paper mache Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles, an allusion to Faust, uh, uh, the, the uh, devil in, the, in uh, Goethe, the Faust story. And it seemed to me that if I tried, I could poke my forefinger through him and would find nothing inside but a little loose dirt, maybe. He, don't you see, had been planning to be assistant manager by and by under the present man. And I could see that the coming of Kurtz had upset them both not a little. So this, this is a, a kind of an image of a hollow man, a paper mache devil that you could poke a hole into with your forefinger. Mm, that. Now, uh, T.S. Eliot actually begins his poem with this as the first epigram, which to me is solid evidence that he's making a connection between this text and that text of the heart of darkness. Okay, so at that point then, we can start using, perhaps we can use the poem that Eliot gave us in the 20th century to uh, be kind of a gloss or an explication of, maybe give us some insight on a better ways to understand what's going on in the novel. So which came first? The novella, okay, so about 20 years later or so, T.S. Eliot uh, published The Hollow Men. One of his most famous poems uh, a Penny for the Old Guy would be a reference to the gunpowder plot. And in, uh, on November 5th, 1605, uh, a group of conspirators uh, by a disgruntled number of parliamentarians in England uh, were rolling kegs of black powder underneath the parliament where uh, King James I was going to speak and uh, they were going to assassinate him. Uh, they got discovered, and their ringleader was a guy named Guy Fox. And this is uh, an event that actually prompted Shakespeare to write Macbeth as kind of an homage to King James, who was Shakespeare's sponsor, and uh, Shakespeare's company was the King's Men. And uh, the play, of course, is about some of the bad things that can happen when you assassinate a king. So King James survives, they caught Mr. Fox and his friends. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. If we go to the very beginning of, the true beginning of all creation uh, in Genesis, these are the very first three verses of the Bible, uh, the Christian Bible of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw, God saw that light was good, and something happened to the rest of my slide, but uh, so forth. So uh, what we see in the poem 
of course, is kind of the antithesis of this, right? We, we see uh, the light is only maybe kind of reflecting on broken columns. Uh, we see eyes that the speaker doesn't want to see, that the speaker wants uh, to uh, not meet in dreams. We see the star fading away. So if, if in the beginning, for a Christian like Eliot was, if the beginning is bringing together all the formlessness and the chaos and the darkness and from that making light and order and you can associate everything you want to with that truth, good versus its opposite, darkness, the unknown, chaos, uh, lies, evil. So the, the true beginning of creation in the creation story in Genesis is, is the, the coming of light, right? Um, so question I think the poem raises is could it be that we are headed back to that formless darkness and to what extent is all the knowledge we're gaining actually not helping us to get more light but actually pushing us farther back into the dark formlessness. Okay, and this is one of the theories I'm going to put forth about the poem. So again, uh, the, the first epigraph establishing this connection between the novella the Bonfire Night, so what happened in England, their version of, it's kind of like a Halloween kind of thing where the kids would go around and um, knock on doors and they'd say, a, a penny for the old guy. And, uh, you know, I mean, a penny was worth more 100 years ago than it is today. So they, instead of getting like candy, like, you know, our kids get when they trick or treat, they were going around for pennies. And uh, they would, the kids the, the, would push around like a stroller with an effigy of Guy Fox, So they would take, you know, like old clothes and stuff it with hay to create like a dummy. So, of course, and this effigy would be stuffed. So an apt epigraph for, uh, for uh, the poem, of course, which is the hollow men, the stuffed men. And the po as the poem starts, we are the hollow men, we are the stuffed men. So there's this emphatic kind of repetition. And notice that at the end of section one, it's repeated again. We are the, the hollow men, we're the stuffed men, as the hollow men, the stuffed men. So we've learned in this class that when things are repeated like that, they're emphasized. So the speaker is one of these hollow men, right? Notice the speaker's identifying as one of them. So as you're reading this, who did you think the speaker was, you know, who, based on what we see here in the rest of the poem, okay? Think about, in your mind, who, who the hollow men might represent. And then there's a motif in this first section of uh, dryness, lifelessness, bloodlessness, and sterility, barrenness, headpiece filled with straw, our dried voices when we whisper together are quiet and meaningless. So there's a sense of inertness. And the, again, the speaker is part of this chorus of uh, voices that even when they speak, value or meaning. A lack of fertility kind of seems to me kind of evoked there as well. Um, wind and dry grass. And then there's this middle part of section one where we have these oxymorons. Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force. So this pile up of oxymorons um, seem all to kind of indicate passivity, the opposite of agency or action. I mean, how do you, how do you make a gesture without motion? A lot of critics uh, note that in uh, section one, there's the allusion to Dante's uh, Inferno. Uh, in the beginning of the Inferno, wherein the, the damned occupy this area called Limbo before they actually start going down into the circles of hell. And uh, this would be um, crossing over the river Styx. So there's people, have any of you read Dante? Yeah. Okay, so maybe in 10th grade? So the, the sinners there are on the banks of the sticks waiting to be ferried across by a Charon, right? And so we have an allusion to that. Yeah, in that beginning of the Inferno, we have Virgil saying to Dante that these sinners have no hope of death and their blind life is so abject that they're envious of every other lot. So the allusion here would be fitting since blindness is one of the motifs of the poem as well. Oh, here we go. So this is the slide I was looking for. So you can see the image of Charon with the sinners waiting to be 
piloted across the river into help. Okay, and we're not really told what Death's other kingdom or Death's dream kingdom are. And then we have, uh, as we get into this part two, we have some imagery, sunlight on a broken column, which for me kind of evoked uh, ancient ruins. I, I really love this, that, that image of sunlight on the broken column. Um, it almost seems to me kind of like a, a post-apocalyptic image of the world after everything's kind of broken down. Uh, it, are ruins the result of civilization and progress? Is that the end result? Ruins? Is that where everything ends up? It kind of, rem we had uh, one of you, uh, your groups came up and did Ozymandias. Who did Ozymandias? So it kind of, this part of the poem kind of reminds me of that. Uh, poem that we read in class where the speaker talks about this great and powerful pharaoh statue just in the dust. Um, and then we have these voices singing that seem at, at a remove from the hollow men. So the hollow men hear these voices. Um, what are they? And then we also have some kind of uh, opposite imagery here. There's a tree swinging, voices singing. So these voices are not quiet like the voice of the hollow man. And the, 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 the tree swinging seems to indicate something that's in motion and something that's alive. Uh, and then he says, these things are more distant, more solemn than a fading star. Rivers between the living and the dead, between, besides just the uh, allusion to Dante. Of course, in Heart of Darkness, there's the river of the, the Congo River going up to Kurtz. If you've read a, or, or watched Apocalypse Now, they're going up the Nung River which is actually not a real river, but uh, that's a fictional river in there as well. And the speaker, the eyes that I dare not meet in dreams in death's kingdom, it seems to me that I don't want to be recognized, wants to remain kind of cloaked. What happened with uh, T.S. Eliot? I told you he was a Christian poet. But then this thing happened in the 1920s where Einstein started publishing his new physical models. And Einsteinian physics uh, contains some notions about uh, what happens with stars and gravity and time and space that began to kind of chip away at uh, the notions for order, the, the biblical notions for order that someone like Eliot would have uh, had. So there's this, at this point, there becomes, in the poem, I think, kind of an intersection between the religious and the scientific. So as he starts talking about a fading star, he's talking about entropy, right? Which is, we now know that what happens to stars is the helium, as it's burned off into hydrogen, the store of fuel eventually, it's finite. You know, like our sun is going to burn out someday. And eventually, as enough mass is burned away into the energy, the, the size of the star will expand into what's called a red giant, and it will eventually just kind of And what's left is this kind of light pinpoint of a, its former self. And the star that remains is just kind of fading away gradually until it's gone. And that will eventually happen to every last star right, in the universe. That's, that's modern astrophysics. This would have bothered someone like um, T.S. Eliot. But in it, he found a metaphor for this concept of entropy. And entropy is the, it's a scientific concept that things eventually unwind. Just like if you take a top and you start a top spinning on a surface, Eventually, the top will run out of energy just through its, its the entropy of the energy being spent, and it'll eventually fall over, okay? And that all things that are uh, activated through energy in creation are eventually going to experience this entropy. So think of it as a form of uh, cosmic death, right? And what I think this poem does is it takes this concept of entropy and applies it not just to astrophysics and the material world and creation, but it also, I think, looks at uh, uh, our civilization and our society, and do we face a kind of moral entropy? 
And the, the irony for me that I think Eliot's putting forth in the poem is that the more we learn, the more we kind of become morally less stable and break down morally, societally. So you guys will have to be the judge if that's actually happening. But it's an interesting idea. So, uh, and Eliot, this new Einsteinian physics was, he was concerned about how it would affect creationism and Christian cosmology and all of that. Um, so, moving on. Uh, this is something that a, a critic uh, that I cited in the earlier slide. Oops. Uh, I can uh, post this for you, Catherine Ebery. Great article I found on Eliot's cosmology. And she writes, quote, the dying starscape of Eliot's poem is largely influenced by earlier astronomy, particularly the Victorian notion of entropy as proposed by Kelvin's second law of thermodynamics. Getting very scientific here. Which suggested that the universe as a physical system is continually running down. So a form of heat death. Okay, so now we uh, begin. I'm going to skip this slide. Okay, so here's, here's a picture I found um, on a Wikipedia page on the theory of relativity, which shows how Einstein's theory posited space-time con con connectivity. And of course, this idea that something the larger the mass of, a, uh, as a, of an object out there in the cosmos, the larger its mass, the more it will warp the fabric of space and time. So things then become relative because of that warpage. Okay. Which is, I think, interesting for our poet because it's, it's indicative of a, of a world where then things are unstable. And one thing you maybe notice with the poem is that it seemed to be kind of fragmentary. Did you notice that? Not only in style, but in terms of syntax and in terms of meaning. And The Hollow Man's a really good example of what we'd call a modernist poem, which is where the meanings are fragmentary and the style is also sometimes fragmentary. You see a good example of that at the very end of the poem. Okay, so the imagery and the diction of the poem evokes fragmentation, emptiness, a fear of being seen for what one is, through parts one and two. Okay, let, let me wear deliberate disguises, rat's coat, crow skin, cross staves in a field, behaving as the wind behaves. Um, so the speaker, again, is one of these hollow men, is, is, is passive, just like a scarecrow in a field. Um, maybe there's a wish to escape from this world where entropy is happening. So let's go into the next part of the poem. So the stone images in part three, again, kind of evoke the idea of a ruined civilization that's exhausted its resources. I posted the slide of Easter Island because if you know anything about Easter Island, it actually used to have forests. And the people that lived there used the timbers to transport and, and uh, move these giant stone edifices. And of course they burned them for fuel, etc. But eventually they denuded their whole island of uh, their trees and their civilization died off and disappeared. Uh, the island can no longer sustain it. The speaker sa says here they receive, the stone images receive the supplication of a dead man's hand under the twinkle of a fading star. It's this idea of a, a dead man praying to some kind of dead image made out of stone. What would hollow men pray for? Maybe for some substance, I don't know. Uh, but the hope seems to be evaporating because the star is fading. It's a, tw it's a twinkling star, it's a fading star. So any greatness that's been there, think back to the poem Ozymandias that was shared, you know. Any greatness is now in the past, far in the past. It has not lasted through the ages, right? Interesting point about this poem. Um, the poem is 420, line, 420 words long. And it only uses 180 words. So there's a, um, kind of a, not a whole lot of progression, a lot of the words repeated. And the poem, in a way, I'd, I think you can say, it exhausts its store of words. So, and again, um, this image of a dying sun, I, I would direct you back to the very beginning of the novella, 
which on the second page of the story, Marlowe says, and at last in its curved and imperceptible fall, the sun sank low and from glowing white changed to a dull red without rays and without heat, as if about to go out suddenly, stricken to death by the touch of that gloom brooding over a crowd of men. And it, to me, if you just take that passage out of Heart of Darkness, you get, I think, a lot of where T.S. Eliot got this poem. You know, he just takes this idea of a, a giant red sun, which it, to me evokes the, the supernova of a star about to blow itself up because it loses it, its gravity. So as he finishes part, two, part three, he says, uh, is, this like, it, it, is, is it like this in Death's Other Kingdom? waking alone at the hour when we are trembling with tenderness. So we have these images of uh, uh, prayers to broken stone, these, the, making ruined ideals, kind of putting them on a pedestal, and we don't see any kind of remaining humanity. Okay, lips that would kiss other people? No, lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone. So think of like the opportunities. Any, any humanity these people could have had is, is missed. They're not taking their lips and kissing a person. They're praying prayers to a piece of stone, right. something that's inert. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, so then there's, in part four, as we get uh, closer to the end here, the hollow men find themselves in this valley of stars which is a sort of limbo without the eyes. There are no eyes here. Earlier in the poem, the speaker did not want to be seen by the eyes. So here there are no eyes. Maybe he's gone deeper into hell. And the valley itself is hollow. It's in this hollow valley. So just like the hollow men, the valley itself is hollow. The idea of a broken jaw would indicate something that can't utter anything, something again, another image of inertness, a jaw that can't speak because it's broken. All right. Our lost kingdoms. Here's an image from the film Apocalypse Now, which to me is what I visualize when I read this part of the poem. It's where um, Colonel Willard gets up to the, to the headwaters of the river and actually gets to where Kurtz's compound is. It's like this last of meeting places. There's really nothing beyond it. We grope together and avoid speech. And I thought they did a great job of that in Apocalypse Now. A lot of you have seen it in the past weeks. Uh, when, the, when Willard gets there, you know, he's, he, there's this kind of manic photojournalist who's talking to him, leading him around the compound, but no one else there is saying anything. They're all just kind of quiet, gathered there. So. Think about what this might represent, uh, this kind of, uh, again, this idea of, you could say the Tumid River could be another image of the River Styx from Dante. And speaking of Dante, the second, or the third stanza here in part four, the hollow man says, sightless, unless the eyes reappears, the perpetual star, multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom the hope only of empty men. So in uh, Dante, in the Paradiso, which is the third volume of Dante's Divine Comedy, uh, from Canto 31, if for those of you taking notes, you can read this, uh, he describes the heavenly host. When, when the Dante, the pilgrim, gets into paradise and sees all the angels, they're all swirling around in this like s giant kind of spiral graph of uh, light. And he describes them as a rose. He uses a simile in there. In fashion, as a snow-white rose lay then before my view the saintly multitude, which in his own blood Christ espoused. Meanwhile, that other host that soar aloft to gaze and celebrate his glory whom they love hovered around and like a troop of bees amid the vernal sweets alighting now, now clustering where their fragrant labor grows, flew downward to the mighty flower or rose from the redundant petals streaming back unto the steadfast dwelling of their joy. So here, this, the speaker says, 
sightless unless the eyes reappear as the perpetual star of death's, the multifoliate rose of death's twilight kingdom. So to me, this is an image of divine order that we see in Dante that the speaker's kind of alluding here to uh, this image of this perfect kind of arrangement of angels. See these, I don't know if you can see in the slide from where you're sitting, but these are angels, just multitudes of angels that make like this white rose that the pilgrim sees. And it's this image of divine love and order and eternity because it just kind of goes on forever. And the faithful have continual life assured within that rose. It's like an assurance. But uh, for the speaker, the hollow man in the poem, is this something that's going to happen for them? It's like the hope only of empty men. So it's a very pessimistic, it's a, a vain kind of futile hope. And then we also, of course, um, are going to be talking about the shadow uh, here as we get into part five. This is an image on the slide of uh, Apocalypse Now of Colonel Kurtz, uh, who's depicted in shadows, mostly in the film. Uh, think of a shadow as a place where light is extinguished. It's a place of things that are hidden, okay? much like the motives of the hollow men. And if you've watched my other videos, I'm not going to go into detail on that in this, this lecture, but in my other videos, I, I went into some length about the motives of those um, who got us into the Vietnam War, the war in Vietnam, which was based on what? It was based on an event called the, the Tonkin Gulf. Uh, and there was a resolution that came out of that that led into a, a huge escalation uh, of military, military uh, adventure there in Vietnam. And what did you guys learn in your classes about Tonkin Gulf? It didn't happen, right? It was bogus. So the whole Vietnam War was based on this one thing. I mean, that's an oversimplification. I mean, there are other layers of causality. But the, the, the trigger for upping the military venture there was this Tonkin Gulf resolution, which was, it was a lie, right? And if you watch my other video, I talked about Iraq and our 2003 invasion of Iraq, which was based on what? WMDs, right? And the weapons of mass destruction ended up being there? No. no. Uh, so then it, it became about, let's, well, let's liberate these people and bring them democracy. You know, and it's, it's like straight out of a chapter from Heart of Darkness, okay? We're going to be emissaries of light. And when uh, we invaded Iraq and there were, they couldn't find the weapons of mass destruction, uh, President Bush went on national TV and said, we are now calling this Operation Iraqi Freedom. So instead of being an operation to stop spread of uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, now we're, we're, now we're there. For, no, no, it wasn't that. Now we're there to bring these people freedom. You know, let alone that we're not going to all the other places on the world where there's not freedom, like North Korea. And, you know, uh, no, we're going to go to this place and bring them freedom. Um, and of course, we all know how that turned out. right? But uh, so there's this question about motives coming from these hollow men who have been taking us into these ventures. And I think uh, for Conrad, it was, you know, the, uh, you know, King Leopold and his Belgian Congo. It was the same kind of dynamic at work. You know, let's, let's bring these people, God and civilization, these, these savages, these animals, you know, and, and let's fix them. That's, that's a stated purpose, of course, but it's not real. Right? So think of the shadows maybe representing that, you know. Um, a prickly pear... Uh, the, here we go around the prickly pear. A prickly pear is a type of cactus. So it's, a, it's kind of a uh, popular name for a type of cactus called an opuntia. And the, the verse there at the beginning of verse 5 is actually from a, a nursery rhyme about the mulberry bush. Right? Here we go around the mulberry bush. Okay. And then he... Um, He's going to finish with getting into the Lord's Prayer. We see this uh, 
start at the second stanza, part five. He says, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act falls the shadow. Think of the shadow as a force of entropy, something that extinguishes light. Maybe he's thinking of a, another distant possible world when he says, for thine is the kingdom. Why is this part in italics? It's quoting, the Lord's it's quoting trying to quote the Lord's Prayer unsuccessfully. Uh, is it another voice or is it still the hollow man's voice? It's, it's almost like there's this vain other voice trying futilely to interrupt, you know, uh, what's being said here, right? And it repeats, between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response falls the shadow. Life is very long. So a, a very kind of futile attempt to articulate what he really wants to say. He just, he can't do it, this speaker. Can't, can't successfully even speak by the end of the poem. And at the end of the poem, I want you to think about this passage that T.S. Eliot, Eliot wrote after this poem. He, this is from a play he wrote titled The Rock. All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us nearer to death, but nearness to death is no nearer to God. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? The cycles of heaven in 20 centuries bring us farther from God and near to the dust. Think of the world of the poem. How, how close to this world that the hollow man's narrating from? It, how close is it to a, a benevolent good God? Does, does this seem to be a world where God's close to it. Seems as far as possible removed from a God. Um, so think of the poetic universe in the poem kind of lacking any kind of stable markers of time and place. And that would go along with this new physics that has come about in the last hundred years, this, this idea of instability and, and slow death that comes out of this entropy. What is the speaker able to do with these natural laws? I don't think he can really deal with them. So the, the, for the speaker, the death of the stars seems to matter the most. And I don't know if I have anything else. So the poem ends with this famous uh, conclusion. How did we do on adding some light to this poem? Did we open it up a wee bit? We lengthened our lives and fought disease Outgrew the earth by twos and threes Great extinction happening now Just like the Permian showed us how Who will survive When will the infinity arrive? There it comes